All right, welcome to the Monadnock International Film Festival in Localist Peterborough, and we are here live at the film festival, and we're interviewing uh, Ken Burns and a couple of gentlemen here that I'll introduce, uh, uh, Yusuf Salam, and uh, everybody knows Ken Burns, we'll, we'll get back to you in a minute, or Raymond Santana, uh, about a movie that, that Ken, you, you produced and, and directed and put together called Central Park Five, which has been making a lot of news. Um, tell me a little bit about the movie. Well, first of all, it's not my film. It's a, a co collaborative effort of my daughter, uh, Sarah Burns, and my son-in-law, uh, David McMahon, himself a respected filmmaker. Uh, and all of us share the directing, the producing, and the writing credit. So it's, it's the three of us. Um, they are the missing folks in the room, along with uh, Antron McRae and Kevin Richardson and Corey Wise, the other three of the Central Park uh, Five. And all of us together have, have made this uh, film about one of the great miscarriages of justice in the latter part of the 20th century in which five young African-American and Hispanic youths were falsely charged, coerced confessions were obtained and convicted and sent to jail and served out their full sentences and then some uh, for a crime they didn't commit. And only later after those sentences were served did um, uh, there was there an attempt to vacate their convictions, to uh, erase their records, uh, but it's now been 10 years, uh, more than 10 years since then, and they have not received any justice uh, from the city of New York. They've launched a civil suit against them, for, obviously, and there has been no settlement, no attempt at settlement, no fast movement to trial. 10 years is an awfully long time. Things go to trial in a year, year and a half. Settlements usually happen pretty quickly. Uh, none of those have happened, and it's been an incredible sort of second chapter to an already tragic story. Well, and, and the story, the, the, the beginning of the story was a, was a rape that happened on, in Central Park. On April 19, 1989, a young woman jogging in Central Park was viciously assaulted and raped and beaten. Um, there were a bunch of kids in the park that night sort of making mischief, uh, hanging out, uh, one other felony was committed, a beating of some man, but the cops decided when the woman was discovered near dead and was presumed that she was going to die that these five were the ones who did it. And they took them in without parents in many cases, without food, without water, without lawyers, uh, and interrogated them in some cases up to 30 hours. Uh, and finally, in the end, they were willing to make statements that weren't true, with the exception of Yusef, whose mother rescued him from that indignity. But uh, later on, the notes that he had given to uh, detectives or did detectives had taken in this intense and arduous uh, interrogation where Yusef himself thought that he was going to be killed. So they were desperate to say anything, being the good kids they were, and out of the system to say anything to please what they wanted. And finally, all of them capitulated. The others uh, who had participated in the other crimes in the park had been you know, in the system before and knew how to lawyer up and, and got very modest sentences, but they took the fall, and it wasn't until later uh, that they were exonerated, but well after they'd had the guts of their childhood ripped out. How, how old were they when it happened? The two were 14, two were 15, and one was 16, though Corey Wise has uh, some learning issues, he has some hearing problems that sort of set him back. Uh, and so, unfortunately, he was tried as an adult and sentenced as an adult and served in adult facilities that, uh, you know, the nightmare continued. And, and you can see this also as something that isn't just in the past, because these uh, convictions, their experiences in prison, the terror that uh, they and their families were subjected to doesn't go away even when they unlock the door and say, oops, or, sure. uh, you know, we, we are vacating your convictions. They are still living with the kind of, in some ways, the PTSD of that experience. And, and that's part of the outrage that I think animated Sarah, my daughter's um, desire to do this, and, and continues to out, uh, animate our interest. What's so remarkable is that these men are without much anger, uh, very little obvious uh, expected bitterness, and have a kind of patience and forbearance which has turned the Central Park Five from a group of people who were the worst people on earth in 1989 to among the most admirable and heroic people I know. That's awesome. I mean, that, that, that is awesome that, that it is where it is now. Obviously not that what happened, but, um, but, but the people that you are. But how, um, I guess 
What I'm interested in is how, why was it so important to, 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 to blame these five people? It, was there a pressure to, to have this case closed, or was there a reason why they didn't take more time to try and, and, and go? Was there, did they, was there a misstep in, in? Yeah, there was, this was, as the mayor at the time, Ed Koch, who just recently passed away, said, is in our film, uh, gave us an interview, gave me an interview, said this was the crime of the century. And so there was a great deal of pressure. But within a few hours of, um, they, had, they had rounded up uh, Raymond and uh, Kevin Richardson and other kids in the park, and then later collected Antron and um, Youssef. And Corey went along just to hang out with his friend. They didn't know each other except Corey and, and Youssef. And, uh, you know, as he said, you know, they went down to the station, and Yusuf came back seven years later, and Corey came back 13 years later for a crime they didn't commit. Within hours of discovering the woman's body, they had, we're going to let these kids go for juvenile courts, you know, unlawful assembly, that sort of stuff. And um, suddenly they said, these kids must have done it. And, you know, despite the contradictory testimony, uh, a very bloody crime scene with no of the, none of the crime scene on the boys and none of the boys on the crime scene. This missing DNA, contradictions within their confessions and contradictions between their conf confessions and no acknowledgement that there was another person present, they nonetheless were convicted and uh, sent to jail. And so, you know, th this was uh, not just a rush to judgment, but also a very complicated tale of where I think, I believe, this is my own opinion, that cops and prosecutors knew fairly early on that they had the wrong guys. But the train had left the station. The public was satisfied. The, uh, the you know, the bloodlust had been done. And to say, hey, we screwed up, it's actually this serial rapist whose who's, um, MO is over all of this thing and who would later confess to doing it from prison. Um, and his DNA is matched that unknown DNA semen sample that was there. I mean, this is one of these, it's, you know, Kafka uh, couldn't write a more terrifying story for five kids who just, you know, it was the eve of a, of a day off from school, it was Passover, and um, they got passed over. So, so, Raymond, tell me how, for instance, you, when this all happened, I mean, what, uh, how long between between you being taken to the you, were you handcuffed and taken to to jail and then did you get out for a period of time as they were going through the trial where you you know from the from the time that the event happened and, and then being sentenced how, how long did no that I take? never got a chance to get bail I was you know I was given bail but I couldn't raise the money so during the whole time of trial to sentence in to 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 going to uh, you know prison. I was inside. I never had a chance to get out. So you, were, you went literally from, from being in a park one night yeah. to, to not seeing the outside. To not coming out seven years later. Wow. That's, that's just amazing. And same, same story for you? No, you I said? Was, you know, I was able to make bail. Um, and it was the most horrifying experience on top of that to be out in the public and have this stigma of, rape, of, of a rapist being placed on you um, to constantly live in fear because of that. And you know, go, going back and forth, as uh, Corey says uh, so eloquently, as if it was my job, going back and forth to court um, every day, um, and then ultimately convicted after about a year of being on bail. When they, you know, came back with the verdicts and said that we were, they were finding us guilty. So you spent seven years, and you spent how many years? About seven. As about, well. about seven. Yeah. So, so uh, what, what did you think about when you were in there for for the first year or so, and then and then the next consecutive six years, I mean, did you, did, did it become uh, hopeless? Yeah. Or? You, you feel like your life is over. You know, they have this, uh, they give you this calculation of your time, how much time you have to serve, when is your first parole board, you know, mine was in 1994, this was 1990. For me, that felt like forever, you wow. know, and, and, and with the, like, like you said earlier, within those times, you know, things happen, you know, we lost family members. My mom passed away when I was in prison. So she never got to see me exonerated. You know, she never even got to see me reach my parole board, which I was, all, you know, at the end I was denied. Um, and so, you know, it, it, you feel hopeless, you know, and on top of that, we felt like the whole world was against us. So we was literally like the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. Were you able to communicate in prison with each other? I mean, did you share, or were you in different prisons? We was in different prisons, but we was able to write um, and, and, and try to keep each other focused throughout those, those years.
Uh, you know, can I just say something? Um, their behavior was so exemplary. I mean, after they'd come out and realized what they'd done to themselves out of the, the interrogations and these videotaped confessions, um, they immediately recanted, said, wait, wait a second, we didn't do this. You know, this is crazy. Um, we thought we were implicating other people that were implicating us and after all this time. Um, but then offered a chance at a plea deal, turned it down. Um, every time they went to par parole, if they had admitted that they had done this, they would have had less time. They did not admit a crime that they didn't do. All of them sought higher education diplomas while they were in uh, prison, and as long as those programs, which were eventually taken out, three of the five were able to uh, get those uh, degrees uh, and certificates, uh, and they worked hard. Um, they came from good families. Their families were, for the most part, supportive. Raymond's dad never doubted for a moment his, his innocence, uh, but many other family members fell away and, and, and saw him as guilty, and have only now, as the film has come out, uh, sort of come back to embrace and sort of say S sorry, you know, like that. But this is a long time. It isn't just the time served, but it's also the extra 10 years tacked on. But uh, it's incredibly amazing that there are people within. And, and, and remember, when the, f when the guy came and said, no, I did it, and the DNA matched, the district attorney assigned new prosecutors, and they reinvestigated. And their report uh, prompted the district attorney to join with the defense in asking a judge to vacate their convictions, which he did instantaneously not even a pause in his breath. And so that's settled, but there are people within the media and people within the police department and people still within the prosecutor's office, people who made those mistakes early on that are so invested in keeping those mistakes from being sort of understood by everybody that they're pushing that they're still somehow guilty, even though we know a lot of things we don't know about what happened in that park that night. But what we do know and a court has agreed, is that these five did not have anything to do with it. Period, full stop, end of sentence, didn't do it. What would be the financial ramifications if they did admit it? And they said, look, you know, you're right. We, we actually did make mistakes. We owe you a lot. What would that be? Is there a price on that? that I, I, I'm not involved in yeah. this, and I have no interest. So I could yeah. speak just and tell you there's no amount of money that could possibly sure. you know, pay them for something that's been stolen and taken away and the lack of the love of a mother or the lack of the ability to, to touch your, 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 your siblings and to do the things that you'd all we plan to do. Uh, the city of New York has a budget of almost close to a billion dollars to settle such things. The fact that they've spent 10 years you know, stubbornly not doing this. And stuff like this often is settled within a few months and things come to trial pretty quickly and it's been 10 years and we haven't been to trial. So they haven't been to trial. So we as the people haven't been to trial and given them their day in court. You know, Yusuf said it. You know, they were pretty quick about the convictions. You know, this is, you know, it's happened in April. By July of the following year, uh, you know, Yusuf was uh, convicted. Um, this was, you know, you were convicted. Um, that's pretty quick. They could use some of that same justice right now, but I'll let them talk about I mean, it. We're it's not, that, we're not, it's, it, there's no amount of money that can equal to the, the, the amount of time that we spent or the ridicule our families went through, you know, uh, uh, everything that was just stolen from us, you know. But I think what gets us is the arrogance of the city of not wanting to at least come forward and sit down and say, look, let's put a period at this and let's keep it moving. Let's, you know, give us a chance to heal. Give us a chance to put one foot forward and move on with our lives. We have kids now. You know, we want to be able to raise these kids and, and, and finally put an end to, you know, the saga of the Central Park Jaga case. And that's the most important part for us, not about the money. So, so where do you guys go now? I, as far as, from, you know, this, I'm anxious to see this movie tonight, but where, where do your lives go now? Are you looking to... to uh, to have any kind of lawsuits against the city of New York, or are you just looking to... to they filed a lawsuit okay. back okay. in 2003. Is that lawsuit that the city is just delaying and delaying oh. and delaying and delaying? They subpoenaed our outtakes and records to further try to delay this thing, looking, fishing for inconsistencies. You, Yousef, you told Ken you entered the park at 9.01. You told us it was 9.02. Do you always lie? That's what they're trying to uh, gather enough contradictory, you know, uh, supposedly contradictory evidence mm. uh, to, to Im impugn their, uh, you know, testimony when it finally does come to trial. But the facts speak for themselves. They screwed up. 
they have this institutional inability to admit they made a mistake. And that's all that it is. And the, the sad thing is, is that they're willing to let, they, they felt it was expendable that these five black and brown kids could just, well, we'll just mm -hmm. cover up our screw-ups of not getting the guy a couple of days before who did it, allowing him to continue to rape and murder all that summer before he was caught and went to jail for the rest of his life. And it's so interesting, and a story as bad, bad as this is that the guy who confesses, who admits his mistake, is the sociopathic, psychological, psychopathic murderer Mateus Reyes. And, yeah. and it's only, if he had not come forward, these guys would still be registered sex offenders. There'd be places they couldn't do. There would be jobs that they would never be able to get. Uh, their lives would be a living hell still. Yeah. We're, we don't have much more time, but, but just tell me real quick, Yusuf, like, where's your life now as far as you've got a family? and uh... Yeah, um, I have a family. You know, and it's, it's great because you know, I've, I've been afforded some opportunities. And the opportunities are, are ones where I can take care of my family. I mean, we were supposed to essentially die social deaths. We weren't supposed to be able to survive at all socially, you know. Um, but I think one of the great things about this film is that it's now given us an opportunity to breathe a little bit easier. You know, because, you know, in 2002, 2003, the, the convictions were overturned. And we thought that there, just like there was a speedy way that convicted us, there was going to be a speedy way to compensate us. There was going to be a speedy way for us to get this whole thing behind us. And the reality of the matter is that here we are 10 years later, you know, and as Ken always says, you know, this has definitely been justice delayed. And justice delayed also means justice denied, you know. And, you know, Raymond just said, this, this fixing of this travesty that happened, allows everyone to move forward. You know, there are people who, um, from the prosecutor's office and from the police department, they were able to uh, retire. You know, some people have um, gone on and become great novelists, you know, and, and live lavish lives. You know, where we've been, in spite of it all, trying to put one foot in front of the other and continue be, you know, continue to, to um, live, live life as, as much as we can. You know, and the great thing about it is that um, it's become a little easier, but it's never easy. Yeah. How about you, Raymond? Where are you at right now? Well, you know, I work. I have a daughter now, and I'm trying to put my life back together. And, and you stay there, and where do we go from here? And this is part of the process of where we go, for, you know, for us individuals of trying to heal, you know, to, to come to film festivals and to speak, and we speak you know, in numerous places, you know, with college students and, and high school, and seniors in high school, and, and we teamed up with the Innocence Project, and, and, and we, we travel, we do a lot of traveling, but that's all part of us just trying to heal, and that's where we go, trying to find some type of, some type of way to heal, and that's what we can do. Well, thank you guys all for, uh, yeah, I could talk to you for a lot longer, but we don't have time, but I appreciate it. Thank you so thank much. You. Look forward to seeing uh, the film tonight, and uh, uh, good luck with it, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. It.